Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to session number three of Web Connect Plus. So while everyone's just dialing in, I'm just going to ask you all who have already dialed in to just jot us a quick uh, message down in the chat. Let us know where you're joining from today. Pop in your uh, your location, your territory, your country, your company, anything you want to share with us just while we're waiting for everyone to come in. So we've got somebody from Hollywood. Hi, Bob. Antonia. Yes, we know you're here. I should hope you're here. You're part of the session. David from Kent. Yes, keep them coming. Keep them coming. A couple more minutes, chaps, and then we will crack on. Good to see James there from West Sussex. Okay, right. So, looks like most of you are already in. We've got a um, large following today, which is fantastic. This is a fairly new uh, organization slash community that we put together back in 2022. Uh, we want to share information, knowledge, support for each other as we go through the uh, the, the perils of the, the economic climate that we're currently facing. So um, let me just uh, do a few introductions. First of all, I'm Chris. I'm the head of global marketing for Infigo, and I will be uh, chairing the session today. Um, I'm very pleased to have colleague Antonia Fagan, partnership growth manager, also with me from Infigo. And believe it or not, I have Mark Ratt, who um, normally joins us remotely but today you can see and he's not just sitting in front of an Infigo roller banner that we've shipped to Canada he's actually joined us in the office today in the UK um, I'm just going to ask Mark real quickly if you could just share um, why you're here well it's awesome to hear thank you I'm going to look up because he's just sitting across the table but awesome to hear we're looking to expand our business across the pound and what better but what bet what better way to do it with uh with friends like Infigo so we're here to strengthen our relationships and uh and form new ones thank you all for joining thank you Mark and I think really that uh kind of underpins the message today um, it's about partnerships and automation to really give uh, and provide our businesses the, the return on investment and generate extra revenue streams that we need now to, to progress. So thanks, Mark. Um, it's not just Mark that we have joining us today. We have um, an all-star cast. We have um, Web Connect Plus new boy, Erin um, Hollandsworth, who's the founder and trusted advisor of Motion Analysis. Um, we're excited to see Erin's demonstration later of his um, very intelligent software. Um, we have um, WebConnect Plus veteran Sean Davis, Director of Technology at Significance Automation. Uh, Sean's been part of the journey of WebConnect Plus since its conception. And uh, Andrew Oswood, um, known as the Wizard of Workflow, also a uh, veteran of um, WebConnect Plus. Andrew, can you just explain um, the terminology for your, your job title, please, sir? Yeah, um, I'm sure everyone's uh, familiar with the Wizard of Oz. My last name's Oswood. So, um, and the Wizard of Oz is is the man behind the curtain, the guy that uh, makes all the magic happen. And a lot of people think that automation is, is magic, but um, I'm just here to to help uh, kind of pull that curtain away and, and show you that it's not uh, it's not magic. You can actually make it happen, um, and uh, that's what we try to do. So there's no spells or playing. Quidditch in the office with Sean. No, no, not, nothing like that. It's uh, it's all pretty uh, pretty uh, simple uh, once you get down to it. Awesome. Thanks for joining us today, Andrew. Okay, and then we also have uh, Richard Askham, who I'll be um, inviting to speak a bit later on in the session. Richard is um, a, a, a guru, I say. I think I've recently labeled him a guru of personalization. He has um, lots of experiences and thoughts. So I'm looking forward to bringing Richard into the conversation a bit later on. So why are we here? Well, as I mentioned earlier, WebConnect Plus was created in 2022. And the idea was we wanted to look at how we could bring all the elements of a workflow together. In essence, a turnkey solution, a panacea that we all strive for in this industry. Um, one of the things that's really important to us is that we created an organization or, or community where we could share knowledge with one another to help support our customers achieve 
um, what they need to do to survive and prosper. So today's workflow will be in Vigo at the front end, then moving to Significant, so we'll be using Tilia Labs products and some of their latest um, software stack. Then we'll see the motion analysis, AI, and intelligent um, software solutions as well. Before we go on any further, there's a few um, little bits and bobs that you can join in today and make it more pleasurable for us and more entertaining for us as well. Um, please jump into the chat, um, share your knowledge, any questions you want to ask, even if it's halfway through the demonstration, please don't be shy. Please jump straight in, ask anything. There's no such thing as a silly question. Okay. Also, we have uh, activated the, the reaction emojis as well within there. So please, if you see something you like, please pop a, pop a little reaction in there. Uh, see something you don't like, please react as well. It's all good. We'll also be running some polls throughout the session. Firstly, to see that you're still staying awake. And secondly, to hear and try and get an understanding of what's going on within your, your current workflow. And of course, that will identify if we and the guys on this call today can help you improve your workflow. OK, so why are we here? Well, first of all, we're going to talk about personalization. But we're going to talk about personalization from a different context. We're not just going to talk about the importance of personalization. And we're not going to talk about whether personalization is here to stay or whether we need it or not. But we're going to talk about the power of personalization along with automation. When you have the two together, you have something quite powerful. So I think Richard will come on later and he'll share his thoughts on his experiences on personalization and how now 21st century, you cannot operate a business without it. And that's really the message today. We want everybody today to understand that they need to start thinking about engaging with their customers and also retaining their customers and then making sure they return. But also they don't want to run jobs or create print artwork that's gonna create waste or increase cost. So we spoke to a customer recently and they are now, as you can see on the quote on the screen, they are now making profit on a job as small as $35. $35 is a crazy amount when you think about the, the jobs that some of you on this call will be running, millions upon thousands, whatever it may be. However, if you can make profit on a job for $35, imagine what could be achieved. So let's meet our case study for today. Let's meet Maria. Maria works in marketing. She is executive director of Printing United. And she has a very busy and stressful job trying to organize a trade show in a very um, high octane, stressful, and should we say creative conditions. So she's responsible for a lot of moving parts and a lot of people. And obviously, as we all know, people can be quite frustrating when we've got something to do. So she needs to have minimal contact with suppliers. She needs to make sure that whatever she gets back from her supplier is of a good standard. And, and most importantly, she needs to protect the brand. She has many concerns. She must make sure the products are ordered, that the color doesn't change, or you know, there's not a change to the artwork that she's uploaded. There needs to be the ability to order on demand as a high number or a low number, and everything needs to come through as expected. She doesn't want to work with difficult suppliers. There's nothing worse when you're under stress and there's somebody that's creating lots of phone calls or emails or generally just being awkward. We don't want that. She also wants to control the process. And sometimes when you're under stress or you're short of time, controlling the process can be the difference of making the deadline or not. She wants to be able to work 24 seven. And the reason for this, as we all know, in the modern day working constraints, time is something that was very precious. Simplicity of the process, passing down tasks to a team member. These are all things that she'd like to be able to do to enable her to be more effective. She also would like to log in to a potential storefront or maybe even speak to a, um, her supplier and repeat uh, orders on a regular basis. So as we also know, with a trade show as well, sometimes you get a lot of last minute um, attendees or changes and therefore you need to be able to run the odd uh, numbers off a small job. Maybe it could just be something as one poster or it could be something as a thousand business cards. Whatever it may be, she has um, multiple challenges that this team today on this call are gonna try and rectify and support her with. So to kicking off the process, right at the beginning, 
she's going to use a web to print storefront and lo and behold antonia fagan is going to kick us off with maria's first job Thanks, Chris. Hi, everyone. I'm Antonia. I am the Partnership Growth Manager at Envigo, and it's a real pleasure to be here again um, today. So just to give you a very quick overview of Envigo, we are a web to print software company, um, and we work in a number of different industries. We work in labels, packaging, um, general commercial print, uh, wide format, and um, also direct to, um, to business. Um, and what I'm going to show you today is, is a website that we've created for this event, uh, for this particular um, webinar to show the example that Maria, um, Maria, that uh, Chris has just talked to, talked to about Maria. So this website here is using our software. So we've built this um, e-commerce platform and then we've created a number of products to, to, um, to show this off. So we have an event kit and we have an ed editable product. I'm just going to show you the static op option. This is something that although isn't personalized, we've created it specifically for that customer. So this is used a lot of use cases within um, events and within um, uh, businesses that we see that are use our software. So this particular event kit we've, kit we've got three products in here we've got a static poster a roller banner a suitcase so a user could even add add items to this if they needed to as well and i can also specify how many i want of each product your final price add it to my cart go ahead and, and check out so we've created it as a really simple easy to follow website it's very market it's on brand it's very um strategic in terms of what the person is allowed to order they're not making too many changes but it gives you an idea of um the type of product that can very quickly be ordered on this one of the things that a lot of our customers ask about is that actually you know as well as needing personalized items people do just need static products and this make means that you know at midnight when i remember that i forgot my roller band i can just quickly log on and order my product and um, forget about it until the next day so that's a very simple kit product. And then what we've also created using our editor, which is called Mega Redit, is an editable poster. So our, our, our editor, again, is using a, a, a myriad of different industries and different products. Um, but this particular product we've created as a, um, a an editable product. Um, and just to show you this, I'm just going to show my tab. Now that the edit is loaded, I can see that I've got the option to make changes to this particular product. So I could potentially change the flag. Seeing we've got Mark here today, I'll be an honorary Canadian. Hope you'll have me. <laughs> um, and then I'll upload an image. So I can upload an image from my, my PC, my, my, my phone, wherever it might be that I'm, I'm making this order from. I see what my logo looks like, and then I can make changes to this if I needed to. And then I can go ahead and start making um, edits to this particular product. So it might be that I want to put a particular booth number that I'm on, a description about the event, um, et cetera, et cetera. In, in this case, I, I won't start typing because I won't be able to talk at the same time. Um, and then we've got options that, like downloading the PDF proof so I can preview what that looks like, um, as well as just going ahead and adding it to my basket. And an, as an added measure, what we've also added to this is the option for users to actually um, have a, an issue of issue detection and in this case it's showing me that I have an is a resolution image so that's actually an onus on me as the customer to say hang on a second Antonia this this logo is not correct if you continue it's going to look absolutely awful on this poster and that's your problem which is really nice <laughs> nice for me I'm actually going to ignore that and um, you have that checkbox to say actually um, this image isn't going to print um, beautifully but she's fine with that um, and then at this point I could go ahead and uh, go ahead and check out and, and place my order. And the checkout process, again, can be customized depending on the person. So I can either log in or I can register or I could do a guest checkout. And, and, and basically, in this case, put in my billing address, uh, billing address, I could pay my delivery method and my payment method. On completion of, of, of purchasing that order, so I, I get a summary and once I've completed that order, I could get a notification to, you know, as you would um, expect to, to say thank you very much for your order, this is a summary um, and we'll feed back to you shortly. Now what's happened at this point is this, all this order information has been sent very cleverly into the next workflow, um, which we will touch upon shortly. Um, and I'm going to hand back now to my colleague Chris. <laughs> Thank you, Antonia. <clears throat> I'm just going to run a quick, run a quick poll. And it's regarding personalization. So <clears throat> we would like to see 
how many of you currently offer personalization on any print products? The options you have are yes, no, or not sure. Now, how you're not sure, I don't know. It should really be yes or no. Please answer. Okay. Give it a few more minutes, but so far, more of you are in personalization already over those that aren't. But there's still three that aren't sure, which I find quite funny. Okay, I'm gonna move on now. So at this point, I think, um, as soon as we have the man in the room, I'm gonna let Mark Rad introduce Significance and uh, the handoff of the files Antonius created into the Significance workflow. Mark, over to you, sir. Thanks, Chris, that was great. Um, so at our core, we're integrators. We really are the extension of our customers and we develop customized workflow automation, including touchless environments to web to print. Uh, my uh, my esteemed colleagues, Sean and Andrew, will be going through a demonstration of Infigo to Infocus Switch to Pit Stop Server, um, and then obviously capping it off with uh, Tilia Labs uh, product. So I'll pass the, uh, the mic over to Sean at this point. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, as Mark said, my name is Sean Davis. I'm Director of Technology at Significance Automation. Uh, with me here, we have the Wizard of Workflow, Andrew, uh, who will be sharing a screen shortly to sort of demonstrate this front-to-back solution with integrating what Infigo has to offer all the way down to what Aaron will demonstrate later with motion analysis. Now, just to give a high level for those of you who have never seen any of the InFocus products before or, or anything from what Tilia has to offer, I'll just give a brief explanation of those products themselves as we're sort of stepping through this workflow so, so, solution, excuse me. Um, so what Antonia has done is created an order through the, the tailored branded storefront of WebConnect Plus, and that data is then collected and passed down to Switch. So Switch itself is, you can think of it as a hub and spoke or a middleware solution that um, is like the glue that binds all these isolated processes together. Uh, it's, it's that workhorse behind the scenes that does all the, the heavy lifting before pushing it to its next destination. Um, it offers a, a selection of built-in tools and a variety of apps or plugins via its own proprietary app store. Um, so really the possibilities are, are endless. It's a sandbox that you can make it do ultimately whatever you need it to do. Very simply, it takes an input, it chains a variety of operations together, and then outputs something in return, eliminating what would be, you know, that that human touch point, that manual touch point that we're really trying to save time on. So once we get that order in, as you can see, Andrew has highlighted where the the operation is sort uh, currently paused before going into pit stop. Pit stop is that next major step in the process that has everything to do with PDF manipulation and, and pre-flighting. Antonia mentioned that there is some pre-flighting that's done on her side as well with analyzing and making sure and notifying you that an image may be low quality when applying it uh, through their system. But a lot of that can also be done on, on this side as well and expanded upon with anything maybe that's not specific to uh, the e-commerce platform itself but you want to make sure something is, is set up correctly as it's specified for a specific press. Like you're doing something with an HP C500. They have a certain set of specs. You want to make sure that it, that it fits that need specifically. So yeah, as I mentioned, you can uh, pre-flight, you can manipulate PDF documents and all that information is then reported back to switch with any relevant data. And uh, what Andrew is going to show very briefly here is one of those sort of branded tailored reports that comes out of pit stop. Now, again, we mentioned the image that was also picked up and reported on here. It also gives a variety of other warnings and potentially fixes that we may have found within the file. So in this particular case, uh, you know, page boxes weren't set up correctly based off the profile that we have set up within pit stop. 
we've modified the, the page boxes. Um, you know, maybe there, there wasn't enough bleed or there was too much compression on an object. We can uh, modify, make any changes we need to to the file before processing it and passing it to the next step. Now this report itself can be tailored and customized to fit your needs. So again, we branded it, we added the Web Connect stuff at the top, but on the left-hand side, you can also see a variety of different bookmarks. Everything from going into detail on uh, page boxes to if, if there's fonts within the file, uh, making sure that fonts are embedded or wanting to know what fonts are subset. All that can be can be listed or we can omit that information, ignore that page entirely if it's not needed. Now, what do you do with this report? Uh, this report can be used internally, notifying if, if you're directing these files to prepress. So in that particular case, we want everything to be as automated as possible, but you could have cases where there is just something critically wrong with the file. You want someone internally to just validate it before moving it to the next step. And those are still going to always be around those outliers. We always like to think of like an 80, 20, 70, 30 rule, right? Let's, let's standardize and let's automate the majority of the things we can, but we want to catch the ones that we still need intervention for. And that's where your pre-press team will shine is focusing on those, those more complex jobs and leaving those simple jobs be. So at the end of this process, uh, what's currently shown on screen, there is the green path, which is if a file is successful. And if a file fails, it goes down that magenta path, which goes to uh, email. And that could be a branded email to a client, or that could be again, notifying somebody internally Whatever you needed to do, this can be tailored for that need. So once something is uh, pre-flighted in this particular case, we're actually going to be uh, ganging the files up together. So if we had three orders or three items with, within an order rather, we wanna make sure that we pass that to Phoenix to actually impose and make sure any relevant things pertaining to that order stick together as they go through the process. Now, before we touch on Phoenix itself, there's a couple aspects here that um, you're, you're probably thinking to yourself, well, there's a lot more going on within this flow than just switch itself, pit stop, and then Phoenix. And you're right in the sense that I mentioned the app store and apps. So what Andrew's highlighted here are some apps actually developed by Significance to um, streamline the creation of a CSV document by creating individual XMLs joining those XMLs together and then converting that to a CSV, which he's showing on screen here. So we can utilize and take advantage of the CSV ingestion piece of Phoenix. So, you know, we're passing the, the quantity, what stock is required, uh, whether or not we're allowing rotation and the path to where the file is, all that is being ingested into Phoenix. And then Phoenix is going to action on based off this metadata this data that came from Infigo or maybe some other uh, logic that we built within the process or the flow to help manage that layout process. So once we impose a file, what do we do with it? Well, we want to generate a report. This is the report that's showing on screen. This is one of multiple pages. The first page is always an overview of, uh, you know, here's the number of layouts we've done. And then it sort of steps into each one of those layouts, uh, what press it's running on, how long it's going to run for. And then again, it's uh, going to just list all the other layouts that are there and then sort of give you a high level of, here's all the products pertaining to this, this job as it runs through Phoenix. Now, Phoenix itself utilizes AI. So um, what you saw was just a very, very, very basic example of an imposition, but it's, fairly robust in the sense that there is a pretty extensive scripting component to Phoenix, which allows you to uh, do any number of things required, but um, you can custom create your own marks. There's, there's a variety of barcodes that you can put on it. Um, if you need camera marks for finishing, for cutting, all that stuff can be utilized. And um, essentially, as we've been talking from start to finish, this whole process was done. Uh, completely hands off other than Andrew having to stop it at certain sections because it does go very quickly. But again, anything can be can be expanded upon, made even bigger than what you see. 
um, if something comes out in, in the report that you need to push to an MIS system or an ERP, which Aaron will, will sort of elaborate on with the data that we would collect out of Phoenix, we would pass over to him, really sky's the, the limit. So we've touched on uh, in Figo sending us the data, sending us the files, processing those files, validating the files and manipulating it any which way we need to and then collecting those up, ganging them together in Phoenix, and then passing those out to Aaron and Motion Analysis uh, for them to do their part. And I'll pass that over to you. Okay, guys, I'm just gonna jump in there. So that seems um, that seems really exciting. Thanks for that, um, Sean and Gandalf. Um, really good that we could <clears throat> see you guys again um so yes motion analysis erin i think um it'd be really good if you could just give us a little bit of um a little bit a bit background into yourself um the, the business where motion analysis has come from just so everyone on the call who's new to uh, motion analysis understands a bit about it um obviously this is your first sort of experience of web connect plus and hopefully the first of many um yeah take the floor sir Thanks, Chris. Um, appreciate everyone uh, taking time to listen. And uh, similar to Significance, we're partners with them. And uh, we're also integrators. And in addition to automation, which is uh, when you talk about industry, and there's Industry 3.0, which is automation, um, we're also then, uh, you may start hearing Industry 4.0. And that's, you know, how do I participate in digital supply chains? How do I let my computers figure out my processes? How do I um, take advantage of AI and machine learning? Well, we need to get data set up in certain formats for these systems to work. And more importantly, so we saw at the beginning, we were front facing, we uh, sold something to a client uh, in the middle there. They went and prepped the file. They did some automations. Well, now it has to be made. How do we make it out in the plant? What's the best way for me to to put it, how do I know my capacity? How do I move jobs around? H how do I track it on a common system? And uh, that's what uh, I'm gonna briefly show you today. Okay, thank you, Aaron. Let's, let's move on to your next slide. And in case, uh, you know, you can never get enough acronyms. So I'm gonna be showing uh, two products in a row. And uh, one is called DigiBlue, which is work order management. So you might see the abbreviation WOM. And then also I'll move on to um, after we assign jobs, if someone's running a printer or a cutter or any process, uh, you have a, an MES system, which is manufacturing execution system. And that's our uh, shift work system. So you saw earlier where they, um, they did the jobs and automated it. And then you saw some hot folders that handed it off to motion analysis. So I'll show a brief video now, and then I'll kind of explain what we do. So the DigiGlue product, um, you heard about APIs. So some of it is APIs, some of it is programming, but the easiest way for me to explain it is that you saw those files and you can imagine those jobs that are done are a bunch of PDFs that went into a folder. And I think the video is queuing up there. Okay, yeah, so when, he, when those files were processed, we can pick them up through the API and just imagine they're going into that folder that you saw. So now the jobs came over with all the data. So I have my job names. I have uh, how many sheets do I need to manufacture? How much was the, or how many parts are on a sheet? What's the setup be between sheets? And in this example, they have two Zoom cutters. So right now I have my schedule for the week and I wanna start capacity planning this out. So I'm gonna start dragging jobs onto the different cutter and as I put them in, you'll notice the percent changes. That means what percent of the shift available am I filling up? What's, what's my capacity out there? And it's automatically updating. Once I have my jobs lined up where I want them, I'm going to push them over into the scheduling for the days that they need to run, and you'll see it to start to do the schedule. So now ShiftWorks is the MES. So now out at one of the cutters or at a printer or at any station, an operator can go and look at their jobs. So when you're looking at here, it's simplified. The blue bar means the machine's on and working. White is when it's in between setups. And you can see I was running jobs earlier, like the beer and wine label were together. 
and the posters. So now I'm going to assign that suitcase job here. So I just scroll down into my list, pick the suitcase run. And I'm going to assign it to here and it's going to start tracking. So it's going to say, hey, you know, you're making 200 of these. There's five of them out on a sheet and the job is starting to run. So it's collecting all that data. Um, I'm not really into it now, but if you've heard of terms of OEE, uh, that's a vital manufacturing number you need to be able to tie into these digital systems. So we're able to track your uptime and downtime codes. Now all that data is collected automatically for you. And then you may say to yourself, well, okay, that's all kind of well and nice, but what do I get more than just recording what happened out there? So the benefits of your work order management and your MES manufacturing execution system are uh, just by putting in the system, we find that you get a capacity performance of up to 25% right away. And this is due to something called the Hawthorne effect. Uh, just having operators participating and knowing there's a system working, they become more efficient. Those uh, downtime codes, et cetera, help them now identify problems and improve their processes. That data now is available for us to apply the machine learning and AI models. So up front, we started doing estimates and until you and that we're doing time projections. Well, we can make the system smarter based on the actual. So we're doing some estimation up front, but over time we can actually track what happens. It's more than just a cut time. It's more than just a print time. I've got to move materials around. I need to do other steps. What does it take me to do a whole job? So having that data enables me to do that. The other big benefit is that our system is agnostic to a supplier or to the type of machine. So you might have an HPC 500, you might have another digital printer, you have some analog equipment, and then maybe you have some different cutters um, or die cutters. Also, many companies grow through acquisition. So I buy a new company, they've got different machinery. It really doesn't matter. So we're agnostic and can attach to any type of machine. Also with our integrations, um, I kind of, you just showed that an order was generated from Phoenix, but if you do have an ERP system that's generating orders and tracking, we can intercept orders from systems, push them out to the machines. And then when the jobs are done, we can let the systems know that it's closed so that you can do rev rec on that finished product. And that's a very brief overview of what we can do. Thank you, Aaron. Um, I have a couple of questions for you real quick, if I may. Um, sure. Could you just remind everybody what WOM and MESS is <laughs> once more, please? Sure. So it's a mess out there in your plant. So how do you clean up the mess? You get use an MES system, manufacturing ex execution system, and then the work order management. Some companies may intertwine these terms. Uh, you might hear scheduling at times. Uh, scheduling can be a little more advanced than a work order management where you're you're doing some what if scenarios, but you need to start here. You need to start collecting your data so that you can then leverage that technology in the future. Okay, and then my second question, Erin, and I think what you're showing us right now is that actually what we're asking to do from the, the web to print point of view is by having a large run of jobs and an ad hoc small job is feasible with this, this solution. Correct, because that's, that's where uh, my partners and I got started was that it's one thing if you were in the analog business and you're used to litho, you, you pretty much got it figured out because we've been doing it for 60, 70 years. But now when digital came into play, you're able to gang run and change combinations and mix small runs in with big runs. And now how do I track that? How do I understand how long it takes to make? There's a, it, it added a lot of complexity to a simple problem. And we're, we're trying to make it to make that process much easier. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much. I'm just going to run a quick poll. We'll be back with Erin later. There's uh, plenty of questions coming through. So, <clears throat> how much of a current workflow is automated? Please select one of the following options. How much of your current workflow is automated? see what results we're getting. Okay, so just to give you guys some idea of the results and how they're looking. We are seeing so far that the majority is 16 to 30%. So obviously that's some uh, room for improvement there. 
Okay, I'm going to move on. So I mentioned him earlier on. He did just pop out of the room to grab himself a coffee. Um, Richard Ascom, please unmute yourself, sir. Please um, bring your camera on. Excellent. I'm going to enlarge your, your face. We can all enjoy. Um, <laughs> welcome to WebConnect Plus. Thank you. Um, tables have turned, sir. The interviewer becomes the interviewee. I have a couple of questions to kick things off. Um, well, I don't, I don't actually know, Chris, whether I want to join in anymore because you, you, you introduced me as a guru earlier on and then you threw a wizard in. And that, I feel as though I've been sort of outranked somewhat. So I'd like, I'd like to be elevated again back, please, to King, if that's King, possible. King Richard. I, I, yeah. I quite like that. It actually fits quite well with some of your uh, extracurricular activities. <laughs> um, I have two questions for you. So that's nice and easy one. First of all, um, what's going on, Richard, with you right now? What are you up to? Couldn't be busier, Chris, to be honest. It's po possibly been the busiest start to a working year that I can remember um, uh, in, in all the time that I've been doing what I do now. And, and that, for those of you that don't know, uh, is really strategic consulting uh, across the personalization space, space, particularly in the print industry. My background sort of led me into that seven years ago as a speaker. Um, and, and largely what happens when you spend enough time on stage is people start to believe what you're saying um, and, they, and they ask you to say it more to them in private. So I've, I've sort of matched my world of speaking with consulting uh, in equal measure and I've never been so busy. Excellent, excellent. And also I'm just going to change slides and just share this with the viewers. Um, tell us about this little event that you're involved with in Munich in Germany in May. Yeah, well, this is where you have to be careful who's in the room when, you, when you're talking, uh, Chris. I was invited last summer to Bruges uh, in Belgium to give a speech on the, on the future of personalization, really. Um, and of course, uh, what I didn't know uh, was in the audience was the CEO of FESPA, Neil Felton, who, who caught up with me after I, I spoke and said um, they've been wanting to do a, a show focused entirely on personalization for a, quite a few years now. Um, and he asked me if I would front the content of that and become the ambassador. So I guess ambassador is sort of like wizard uh, in a way. Uh, but I'm, I prefer king. I prefer okay, king. We'll go with that. We'll go with that. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm uh, fronting the content really for this show, hosting a podcast for FESPA uh, at the moment around the world. Um, you've been on it, uh, so you know. Um, and, and when we get to Munich in May, um, this will be a three-day specific conference really purely about personalization. It will run alongside the FESPA main show and sign expo, but it's an attempt really to get everybody in the world of personalization that's got a view, that's got a capability together um, and, and have a 360 degree view of the opportunity because I'm a firm believer that it hasn't quite hit full stride yet. Okay, hold that thought, Richard, because we've got the Q&A coming up in, in, next, actually. And I have some questions I'd like to ask yourself on automation with the personalization and, and your experience. So thanks, Richard. Um, I'm now gonna move into the Q&A. Um, if you've got any questions, we've had some questions already coming through on the chat. Please, please, please keep them coming. Um, I'm going to start with what I've got in order, first of all. The first question goes to Antonia. Um, we have several customers that we want to create their own artwork for. to Stay on brand, but allow different users to update accordingly. For example, just changing a name or an image. How complex is it to create a unique template within the Infigo platform? Antonia. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. So I didn't get a chance to mention it earlier, but our mega edit editor has a plugin with InDesign. So um, with our InDesign plugin, you can effectively take your artwork and specify the fields and the rules and um, what you want to happen on that particular to template. So once you've made those changes just within InDesign, you're zipping it up and then uploading it to, to Infigo and it's ready to edit. So typically what we've seen previously is that people have had to edit in, a, in one place, change those editings in the system. But with our new um, InDesign plugin, you are now able to just do it in one place to then um, get going and get a product set up. So it's, it's, um, it's very speedy. Thanks, Antonia. So what you're saying, in essence, is um, that our marketing director at uh, Printing United can um, have brand control and also she can delegate the task of building the templates uh, to her designers who use InDesign. Just putting words into your mouth there. OK, moving on. Erin, one for you, sir. <clears throat> I'm going to enlarge you this time. Um, can analog equipment like a LIFO press be monitored as well? 
Uh, yeah, we can uh, monitor any analog equipment and uh, we can also um, monitor any process. So even manual processes, uh, you know, something that's not attached to a machine, someone doing a hand glue or something like that. Um, we're able to track any step, any, sometimes people call them cells in the plant and when you're manufacturing. So, you know, whatever it may be, whatever operation, whatever type of machine, digital or analog, uh, we can track it. Okay, and just quickly, well, a question just come in from David for you as well, Aaron. DigiGlue, mm -hmm. can it talk to Zuds and get real cut times? Do you want to jump on that one, sir? Oh, was it Zoom? Can I talk to Zoom? Um, yeah. It's it's a slightly different approach. So Zoom has an integration with Phoenix, and they're using Zoom's Cut Center to to generate times. You can do it that way. Uh, we have a slightly different approach in ours, where we if you have Phoenix already, we kind of can use a blend of it, but we also then um, have our own logic. And what we're looking at is if you figure out a cut time, that's only a piece of it. If you think about it, I've, between jobs I need to get, if I'm switching from you know B flute to C flute or a folding carton, that takes time. I have problems in between, that takes time. I need to change a blade, that takes time. I have to offload it, clean scrap. So by tracking it, you're figuring out what it actually takes to produce a job. And then over time, your system gets smarter so that those numbers can work. I hope I Thank you. Thank you, David. That. I hope that helps. David, any, any more questions, please pop them in the chat. Uh, next one is for Sean and Gandalf at Significance. How intelligent is Tilia Phoenix? Can rules or different automation routes be created to gang jobs accordingly? Andrew, were you going to take that one or you want me to? Uh, yeah. So clicking buttons. That's uh, um, yeah. Tilia is uh, Phoenix's um, a very dynamic product. Um, you can use any sort of metrics or data that you feed to it to um, come up with a gang run, um, production run. Um, it's really you know more than just an imposition software. It's also estimating. Um, some of the things that we didn't touch on is is you can actually put in prices um, for all your material all your time on the press um, and all that information can all be used to come up with the most efficient layouts and and the best way to process the file. Um, that even includes your finishing equipment where you may not have as, as an efficient layout, but it is more efficient on the back end um, for your finishing devices. So the more data you have, uh, the better. And switch is, is again, kind of that, um, thing where you can put your production rules in, you can take your data from your MIS system or, or different inputs, and then have it translate it to really help feed Phoenix and, and help it come up with those optimal layouts for your production environment. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I'd just like to remind everyone as well that if you have a question and, you, and you're watching this on the replay as well, please, please pop it in as well. Leave your email address, contact information, and we'll get some of the team here um, from Web Connect Plus to get back to you. Um, the whole point of this community is to help and share, provide knowledge and give you a better automated workflow. Okay, next question is going to be for Erin. Uh, we, are, we are back with you, sir. Um, if I pack out or hand assembly areas, can I track that? So if I have to pack out or hand yeah. assembly areas, can I track that? Yeah, uh, some people when they're they're doing, uh, they may may not just be manufacturers, they're doing like Costco work or, you know, club store. And so they're bringing in product, packing it out. Um, any, any type of process. Uh, so uh, one customer has it where they're tracking the hand glue. So they kind of have a little uh, game show button that they can hit. Every time they glue one, they hit it and then the counts go down. And then you're, instead of just trying to figure out, oh, it's 10 seconds of glue, you can actually over time start figuring out based on the shapes to uh, automate that time. Excellent, thank you very much. I'm gonna move on to Richard now. <laughs> this is quite an expansive question, Richard. What is the goal slash objective of personalization for you? Wow, how long have we got? Okay, <laughs> well, rather simply, I think it's to allow, um, uh, the consumer, the, the the buyer, the recipient to feel individualized by the product, the process, the service um, to a point where they can see the value in that more than they can see the cost. Um, and, and, you know, we've established over the last few weeks on the Facebook podcast that the majority of people see the emotion in personalization before they see the price. 
and and it's something that that i think we can all sort of agree with and, and understand that the things that we keep the things that we cherish in our lives are the things that mean the most to us so personalization when done well should unlock that emotion emotional response and therefore create the keepsake and ultimately you know the brand gets a longer half-life out of whatever campaign that's been run to deliver that okay thank you richard and obviously you're sitting on today's session and you're hearing from sean andrew and and erin about all the, the workflow and all the software and all the all the, the crazy stuff behind the smoke and mirrors as, as gandalf would say <laughs> have you have you seen much of this before with um some of the pro previous projects you worked on like share a coke and and then the marmite stuff have you seen this kind of technology going in behind the front end and user interface well share a coke was pre-automation chris uh, i think uh, that's how old i am uh really, okay. unfortunately it was it was <laughs> it was nine years ago um that i was involved in that campaign in europe and if i tell you that uh the the bottles um, you know, came from uh, the Coca-Cola factory. The labels came from a chocolate factory in Germany. The execution was done at a factory in the UK, mine. Um, the delivery was, you know, it was, it was the most piecemeal campaign for something of its scale and something that was so successful. It was not automated in, in any shape or form. However, it still worked. And, and I guess in, in one way, it, it proved that, that you can actually, if you want to do something, you can actually do it. What's happened in, in between time and some of the campaigns that I've been involved in uh, for the likes of Unilever, um, et cetera, have, have just got better and better and better. And, and, and where we've got to today is a capability that actually has possibly gone beyond the consumer um, and, and in a way explains why personalization hasn't quite taken off in the way that everybody expected. Because I think personally that the people see one version of it and imagine that's all of it. Um, mm -hmm. It isn't. There's so many more things that can be done. But, but the print industry has done a fantastic job of, of tooling up, if you like, to, to meet a demand that they are, now, they are now wondering where it is and, and brands and retailers on the other side are wondering what they can do because they don't quite understand what that capability means. So in the middle is an awareness gap um, that hopefully this personalization experience show for FESPA will start to fill. Okay, excellent. Thanks, Richard. Great answer. I'm going to move over to uh, Sean and Andrew now. Okay, um, Sean, I'm just going to highlight you for a second, sir. How intelligent is the Tilia Phoenix? Can rules or different automation routes be created to gang jobs accordingly? Yeah, similar to what Andrew was saying earlier, um, it ultimately goes back to business rules. Um, what would you like the system to do? And where is that data coming from? So in the case of what we demonstrated here with Infigo, if Infigo is driving the process from the start with uh, stock information, if, if we're getting into grades, quantity per item, all that stuff is being pushed over to Phoenix and is ultimately what's driving Phoenix on what it can and can't do. Um, I did mention scripting within Phoenix. So you can also extend the functionality a bit more there to be able to uh, completely customize it further than what some of the built-in tools are capable of. And then outside of that, bringing switch in into the fold and, and pit stop uh, if we need to further modify the layouts, then we can we can do some of that sort of custom programming and styling to the layouts via pit stop with switch and then push that off to be printed. Thank you, Sean. Uh, I think Andrew, you wanted to answer a question. Do you want to jump in real, real quick? Yeah, it looks like uh, Bob had a question about um, automating uh, preflate. Um, and what the best practices for fixing that is that sending it to the customer and sending it to prepress. Um, what I've found in the past is is that really depends on you know your relationship with the customer. If if you have um, smarter customers, I, I want to say, or, or more um, savvy customers, careful, you know that careful. may be some <laughs> something that you want to. Um, send that back to them because you're you feel confident that you're not going to overwhelm them. Um, and, and that's the, one of the beauties of Switch is all that is customizable. So if we had data that said, uh, you know, we have pro customers that um, they um, are, are going to be fine with some more technical information, then we can certainly pass that on there. Um, uh, the other nice thing about Switches and Pit Stop is you can totally customize those messages. So some of the, you know, default pre-flight information may be 
a little high level, a little maybe too technical. Um, you can actually really massage that and work with your you know, marketing teams, your customer relation teams to really customize those messages to help um, you know, make make the uh, the blow of maybe their their artwork not being perfect um, a little little less damaging to them. Um, awesome. Now that's really good to know. And I think also um, just to say, um, Andrew, and maybe you agree or disagree, but this adding that into your kind of workflow helps again keep that profit in those smaller jobs that we spoke about right at the beginning of the of the session when we spoke about that 30 dollar sorry 38 dollar job i guess by having the pre-flighting and having those and focus products in there you're taking out the touch points more and you're taking out the you're keeping the automation checking the artwork making sure it's ready to go on the press um rather than having somebody pick it up and manually do it yeah right? there, there's definitely certain levels to it as well um where you don't want your operator to spend any time on it you can push that back on the customer and then you're saving operator time um, to work on them, those more complex cases and um, you know saving the customer money by not having to charge as much for your jobs. Awesome. And thanks, Bob, as well, for answering, asking us that question. OK, so next one is for Antonio from Figo. Um, you mentioned on your demo that it only takes 10 minutes to set up a single storefront on the Infigo platform. How accurate is this? And is that time frame correct? So I'm just going to move over to Antonia now. I'm just going to. Um, so yeah, we've, again, we've launched another. Oh, you can hear me. We've met, we've launched another new product, which um, allows. Uh, we're trying to simplify again building storefronts, building products, um, and we actually it's five minutes, but we say ten just to give us a bit of um, leeway. I've also just noticed that Joe's asked a question um, about new design arts and layouts. Um, there's a couple of different ways that this can be managed. So sometimes what some of our customers do is they create different customer roles, so that a particular type of person when they log into a portal they might be able to see more products. Um, and for example. Um, they have uh, the option to have a design person type login so that the type of product that they create is in an uploadable product. So rather than having to have a completely designed from scratch product, um, someone that's competent or a designer would then be able to get a price for a product and just upload their artwork and then get it into their workflow. So I think that's what you're, I've a bit of um, artistic license on that, but hopefully I've asked, answered that eloquently for you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, and um, just real quick for me, Anton. Um, so you mentioned five minutes. Um, is there a record for um, launching a storefront within Figo? And is there a prize if anyone can beat that record? There isn't currently one, but I think that's a really good shout. <laughs> we'll get a little uh, prize pot come somehow. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I've got a quite an expansive question now for everybody in the group is, and this is, this has not been aimed at anyone in particular. Um, I love how streamlined this approach is in brackets, web connect plus. Um, thank you, whoever you are. Um, how hard is it to integrate these systems? I'm assuming you mean the systems we're talking about today. How hard is it to integrate these systems and where do I start? And the question is to all of us. So what I'm going to do, first of all, um, I'm going to start in order. I think that's the fair thing to do. So I'm going to start with Antonia. So um, let's say Maria's come to you and she said, right, I want a turnkey solution. I've seen the Web Connect Plus um, webinar today. I'm going to start with Infigo. What do I need to do? Um, go. So the, generally the way that we work is we kind of get a bit of an overview of their project and then we can kind of map out how the best way is it that someone can can get going. I think um, the benefit of our relationship with people like Significance is that we can have a completely joined up story. So it might be actually, Antonio, we need this, the, only the upload functionality and I need pre-flighting, but I don't know where to start. Okay, great. We can get you set up with that. Um, but let's talk to Mark's team um, and get a um, pre-flight um, solution get um, going, get some pit stop profiles going. So we can create a complete joined up story. Um, and that's one of the, the, the massive benefits that we found working together. Thank you, Antonia. So let's move on to, I guess, oh, who from Significance wants us to take on the process there? Mark, Sean, or Gandalf, who wants to take it? <laughs> I'll, Sean, I'll take up. it. If, if you no spoke first, can. you're up. Yeah, yeah. Um, so one of the, the I guess, products or services that, that we offer um, 
well, I guess to, to start off, all three of these products that we've been talking about in Figo and then what we're doing from the switch pit stop side and then what Aaron will probably elaborate further on after me is all of these could be started and worked on at the same time. Um, so while you're setting up the Infigo storefront, you could also be setting up your switch workflow and getting some pre-flighting going, further pre-flighting and in position done on, on this side, and then also working with motion analysis to get some of your uh, sheen operations and all that stuff worked out at the same time. We also offer a what we classify as, as turbo packs, which are sort of like quick start processes. Um, where within a week or two, we can have a pre-built workflow set up for pre-flighting, for doing some either step and repeat or ganging of jobs via a, a couple of different products that we offer for imposition. And uh, and yeah, we've we've had a couple couple ongoing projects now that have started with our Turbo Pack Quick Starts and then expanded upon that with a various set of integrations with other systems. So within a, a couple of weeks, definitely, we could have something up and running. Okay. And then I think then that leads nicely on to yourself, Erin. And I'm also going to get Richard to tag in on the end from a consultancy point of view as well. So Erin, so um, obviously the customer, Maria, has spoken to Antonia, spoken to Sean. She's now on the phone to you. She's been um, told to speak to you by Sean. Sean's told her, you know, you need this in your life. What do you say, Aaron? Uh, what we've found and what works really nice is, especially if it's new to a customer, instead of doing less, you know, you're a, a big concern with, uh, I'll just pick a number, 32 operations, uh, 22 pieces of equipment. Instead of trying to do the whole thing at once, we like to do it as a, as a pilot initiation. So maybe you say, hey, let's, let's start and do the digital cutter and the digital printer, and we're going to handle the digital workflow. We'll do a proof of concept, put it in, see how it works. Because once you have it working in one spot, it then now can scale up through the whole company. And then I think it, it makes it easier for a customer to get started. And instead of looking at this big, massive project, I can ease into it. You can do it all at once if you want, or you can say, hey, I just want to bite off a little bit at a time and then scale it up. You're able to do it that way. Okay, that's really good to hear. Um, Richard? Um, from a consultancy point of view, you've heard the, the software guys, you've heard the front end marketing side of it. How would you um, help Maria get started um, with a turnkey solution? I think there's never been a better time, uh, Maria, uh, to, to be getting into this world. You, you've heard from so many experts tonight that are all joined together. They're all working together. I don't think it actually matters which end you come in at because they're all going to work with you to, to, to make that process so much easier than it's ever been. Um, I don't think there's ever been a time uh, really when this is this collaboration has worked so beautifully. The Avengers have assembled for you, Maria. Um, so <laughs> take advantage of it. And, and if you start with the wizard, just tell him that the king sent you. <laughs> Excellent, Richard. I've got one question for you as well that's come through. Um, there's, there's a phrase that's banded around called personalization 2.0. Could you just explain um, to, to, to the person that's asked this question what personalization 2.0 stands for, what it, what it may, may mean, and actually, is it actually something, is it a thing? Is it real? Is it a thing? Um, I, I don't know. I think 2.0 is just a way of saying we've got better at the stuff that we used to be rubbish at. Um, uh, so, so you know, it's a bit of a, a, a relaunch thing. I, my point just then about having such interconnectivity now between all, all the players that are uh, uh, can enable that to happen is probably 2.0. It's just a, a better community that allows these things to, to go forward. I don't think anything's changed in the consumer's desire to receive yeah. personalized stuff. Um, I think it's just on the on the supply side, it's just got better. So 2.0 probably is a, is a nicer way of saying we're better than we used to be. Excellent. Thank you, Richard. Um, questions are still coming through. So this is this is fantastic, guys. And, we, and if we don't get to answer all the questions, please, uh, we will try and come back to you um, as soon as possible by email or we'll, we'll arrange a call with you. Um, one question I've been asked is a really, really good one. Um, this is for Sean. Uh, Sean, I'm just going to enlarge you now, my friend. Um, everything you've shown today from the significance part of the workflow, is it out of the box? What a question. Yes. Yeah, everything we've showed at this point is within the realm of what Switch does without any sort of, of special scripting, programming, none of that stuff. But with any project, um, 
we can certainly customize and tailor it to be out of the box to fit the specific need that you have. Whether you don't quite like how, you know, as we relate back to, to Phoenix, and I was I was saying you could utilize it. If you don't like how Phoenix is actually laying out the, the files or it's missing a specific type of mark that maybe it can't do out of the box, we can certainly customize something through Switch, through Pit Stop, and tailor it to fit the need. Awesome, thank you. Uh, the next question, I'm just going to go over really quickly. It was, uh, can significance bring pre-flighting into an e-commerce storefront like in Figo? Yes, Andrew's already answered that. So that's a fantastic one. Thank you for that one. We have uh, another question to all the um, all the suppliers on here tonight. Um, are these platforms all SaaS solutions? I think um, from Infigo's point of view, Antonia, um, you can answer that one. Obviously, I know the answer, guys, but I'm just going to let Antonio answer that one. Yeah, we're a, we're a SaaS solution. <laughs> yeah. Obviously. Okay, uh, Sean. So, uh, currently, the way and focus and Tilly operate, um, they are something that you install, but you could certainly, if you wanted to install it on AWS or some sort of a virtual environment, um, it's it's certainly possible to go down that path. I know right now that InFocus is working on some capability to go SaaS driven, um, but that's a couple of years away in that regard. But yeah, it, uh, eventually majority of the products that we utilize in our day-to-day -day in the industry will all go SaaS. Okay, thank you. And then Erin? Uh, yeah, our, our software is all SaaS, but the... Um, when you're doing the machines, there is some little hardware that on certain machines, you need to put a little piece of hardware on that can send signals to let the system know that it's on. So very, very little hardware on site, but there, are, there is some hardware. Everything else is sauce. Okay, thank you. And I've got one last question and we're gonna wrap up. Does any software we've seen today do status tracking and updating? Right now, I have a problem that the HP C500 does not talk to my other workflow and update the status to print it. Who would like to take that one? Um, <laughs> I, I can at least. Oh, um, there you go. Now, when, when you say update, I, I can I can show jobs as complete if you need it to close out into your MES system. I, I, the answer is I can, asterisk, depends on the ERP. Some people are more open than others. I, I'll leave it at that. But, but the answer is I have the capability to close out an order as complete. Okay, brilliant stuff. Yeah, Switch would also be able to handle those integrations in between multiple systems um, as long as, you know, the, the HP can connect and switch and then we can... Um, do some sort of API call back to the other system. So, um, you know, that's kind of switch we've always said is kind of the glue that like uh, connects all these different systems together. So um, as long as we're able to receive data and send data, um, we have that capability. Okay, thank you, Andrew. I'm gonna start wrapping things up there. So um, thank you, Sean, for today. <clears throat> thank you, Andrew, Gandalf, Wizard. Mark, thank you for joining us as well. Antonia, awesome. Thank you as well for your time as well. Uh, Richard, always a pleasure, sir. Just quickly, one last plug. Where can people see you? Where can people pick your brains and how can you help them with uh, bringing automation and personalization to their workflow? Come and find me on LinkedIn. Dead easy. Love it. Love it, love it, love it. Okay, I'd like to say thanks to everyone who's attended today, everyone who's joined the session, everyone behind the scenes that put in that extra time to try and make this a community that gives something back. Um, we'll be back in April with the next session and with a little bit of breaking news, um, which will be an industry first. So thanks, everybody. Thanks for your time. Remember to drop us a message if you want to ask any questions. And uh, if you want to come on or share any content, we'll also welcome that as well. Thanks a lot. Bye for now.